lunchtime talks in math and science. Uh, it's my privilege today to introduce a special Halloween edition, Dr. Miller talking about the molecules of witchcraft. Thank you very much. Before I begin, in honor of witchcraft, I think I better do a little bit of magic here. I'm going to go ahead and, and do that for you. I um, think light up would be a little bit better for that. And goggles is already here. I forgot them. Another little guy, so I'll have to bring him back. And today I'm going to talk about the molecules of witchcraft. And so um, you might ask yourself, um, you know, am, am I a witch? I mean, I just kind of <laughs> did something kind of scary there, you know, things were changing, all kinds of stuff. And no, I don't profess to be a witch. Okay? So not every day. Anyway, uh, my test was Monday, right? So, um, but, uh, why would I choose this subject? Well, it's molecules. Duh. But then also, as Willow from the internet tells us, witches do? Well, one thing they do is they make potions. And we usually think of them making potions in large cauldrons. Well, I make potions. I just make it in little beakers, right? Mm -hmm. They cast spells or hexes. We usually think of those as being malevolent, like causing damage or hurting people with those. But they had also could be a bewitchment, right? Make you healthy. They fly on broomsticks. Oh, not too sure how that one works. And then they have a familiar. In case you're not familiar with a familiar, that's usually thought of as being a supernatural being that aids the witch in their work, usually has powers of its own, and usually takes the form of an animal, like a cat or a toad or a rat. Well, witches wear funny clothes. I came in in a cute hat, right? We usually think of black and black hats for witches. They celebrate what's called a sabbat. Now, there are two definitions for that word. One is a black mass, which is usually thought of being a um, perverted uh, way of celebrating a Christian mass. But the other word is simply the celebration of any of the eight pagan festivals that are celebrated during the year, one of which is today. Today is the, the pagan celebration of Samhain. This is the end of harvest festival. But on this day, the doors to the other world are open wide, and those spirits can freely come in and join us, right? I don't see them yet. Anyway, well, one thing we can do is wear our 
costumes to avoid being noticed or recognized by malevolent spirits. Usually those spirits are our friends. There are family members who have died. Set a place for them at the table. Have an offering for them in your house. But those malevolent spirits, we have to watch out. And when they show up at your door tonight, you better give them an offering, right? <laughs> Sometimes we say that they enter into packs with the devil. This actually is um, a sad part of witchcraft and a misunderstanding, perhaps. Really, before the year 1350, witchcraft was considered to be fine. Okay? Anybody could participate in that activity. It was usually called sorcery rather than witchcraft. But all that was was trying to um, get a handle or control nature around us. And there was no harm done. If harm was done, it was up to the person that was harmed that was to prove that. Otherwise, all court costs and everything were on that person who said that the witch had hurt them. Everything changed about 1350 when the Inquisition, which was, is the court of the church who was involved in trying heretics, they decided to change their, their uh, focus and encompass witchcraft. And so they started trials of witches about then and said that they were evil because they were in consort with the devil. They're part of a pagan religion. Well, that makes sense if today is Samhain, right? Let's talk first about the potions of witchcraft. So many of the women who were accused of witchcraft were really actually just skilled herbalists. So there wasn't a lot of really good physicians back then, right? So if you needed a potion for something, you go to somebody who knows what they're doing. So these uh, women would make uh, teas that you could utilize to help you to feel better. One of those was a tea made from willow bark. I bet many of you have taken willow bark sometime in your life. You just didn't drink it in a tea. Yeah, the active ingredient in the willow bark is salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is made into aspirin. And this is very common in these days. <coughs> you can't patent a natural substance. Change it just a little bit, now you can patent it and sell it for lots of money, right? So make aspirin out of that willow bark. They would use celery root and celery seed to cure muscle cramps. They would use comfrey, otherwise known as knit bone, for healing injury. Parsley was used to induce miscarriage. Now, parsley can be used both in a tea and then also um, if it's placed in the birth canal. This will cause miscarriage. And then you can also use um, ivy to relieve asthma. And it's really thought that if you grind up that IV and put 25 drops into a solution and then drink that, it is as effective as using an inhalant. <coughs> One that I want to focus on is digitalis. Now, digitalis is an extract that comes from a beautiful flower known as foxglove. This is a mixture of cardiotonic steroids, making, um, meaning that they uh, affect the heart, and it's extracted from that foxglove plant. Now right here, this is um, the digitoxygenin. This is one of the, digit, of one of the cardiotonic steroids that we can get. And notice that it says glycoside. Well, anybody who knows what that means knows I'm missing a few sugars over here. Sorry about that. But, this digitoxygenin, the main part of it is this steroidal part, which has the effect. Now, this particular guy right here has been known for centuries to treat a condition known as dropsy, better known today as congestive heart failure. In fact, in 1785, William Whipping, who was a physician back at that time, talked with the old woman of Shropshire. He was interested in how she was able to cure dropsy in people in her community. So he learned of her ability, and he isolated the digitalis, patented that, right? And it's still in use today to cure this particular heart failure problem. <coughs> now, how does it work? This is the world's largest 
largest and squarest neuron or nerve cell. <laughs> and the idea here is, is that in order to get any messages throughout your body, throughout your, your nerves, you need to have polarized membranes. That means positive on the outside, negative on the inside. Well, it's going to take a heck of a lot of energy to ensure that that is true. This protein right here, this is the sodium potassium ATPase. So at the expense of ATP, it's going to pump potassium in and sodium out. Okay? So that's all it does. And about 30% of your resting energy is spent doing nothing more than that. Now, what's really happening with that ATP? No magic. Break the ATP in energy, right? ATP is used to phosphorylate that pump. So we're going to transfer that P onto the pump, and it's going to change that pump. <coughs> it makes it change its conformation, makes it change its shape. And in that way, it can move the ions across that membrane. There is another enzyme, a phosphatase. Oh, about chemistry class knows that one. There is a phosphatase that removes that phosphate. So we phosphorylate, change conformation. Take that phosphate off, change conformation. But if that phosphatase is inhibited by the cardiotonomic steroid, stuck, right? I moved some ions out, oh, now I'm done, right? No ions out, no ions in, I'm stuck. So now what's going to happen? No, deep, no polarization of that membrane. However, when that pump is inhibited, sodium starts to build up, and the cell breaks out, right? And we're going to have an exchanger for calcium that gets turned off. Send that sodium out, bring that <coughs> calcium in, and calcium is what leads to harder, stronger contractions of the heart. So solve that problem for someone with congestive heart failure. And this medication is definitely used today, but not just as a straight herbal form. Most of us are familiar with this type of picture. It's a little dark, sorry about that. But this is like a Halloween card. This actually comes right off of a Halloween card and we pass around cute little pictures of witches, right? And so you might think of when you look at it, you know, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Maybe you don't know it goes on and on. <laughs> Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw, toad that under cold stone, Day and night, half thirty-one. Sweltered venom, sleeping got, boil first in the charmed pot. This is from Macbeth by William Shakespeare back in 1606. He knew even back then witches made potions, but something has changed. We're not just using plants anymore. Now we're using animals, and we're using toads. They're gross anyway, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, toads know how to fight back, right? They make what is known as bufotoxins. Now, bufotoxin is from a common European toad, but there are others in that genus that also produce these types of toxins. Interestingly enough, it's chemically similar to digitoxygenin. So, just want to point that out. There's a bunch of action happening over here, but look at this steroid ring right here with all of this good stuff on it, okay? So similar, not exactly the same, but similar. <coughs> it has similar effects, oh, except it'll kill you, right? Because it's a cardiac poison. Now, this is a little bit questionable. If your dog gets a hold of one of these toads, that is not good, okay? You know, all kinds of slathering, needs to get them to the, to the vet right away. For us, it's going to take a little more. Most of us weigh more than our dogs, and so it's going to take us a little more. So it's really thought that perhaps they weren't trying to kill people, but they were. <coughs> so, but why would you want to kill people? Why would they do that? Oh, I don't know. We're 
revenge, money, power. So here's one that would definitely bring you some power. So here we have a zombie powder. This actually, this zombie powder, now this hasn't necessarily been proven, but it's thought that zombie powder is actually tetrototoxin. This is actually isolated from puffer fish, and it blocks what are known as voltage-gated sodium channels. And that's going <coughs> to block depolarization of the membrane, which I'll explain here in a minute. And this can cause death, or just a death-like thing. <laughs> so, over here, this is now no longer the squarest neur neuron, but probably still the largest. And this is showing us how a message is actually <coughs> sent from one nerve to another. So I have a nerve right here, and on it I have some proteins. And these proteins allow sodium to come in. I want to let sodium come in so that I can depolarize the membrane. Remember that our membrane is supposed to be positive on the outside, negative on the inside. But to send a message, I'm going to depolarize that membrane. So I'm going to let some sodium in. And that's going to change that membrane. And that's going to change that <coughs> one and that one. But these are voltage gated. So when some ions come in, that causes the next one to open. Oh, unless that guy's there. That tetrodotoxin binds to these voltage gated sodium channels and says, don't you dare open ever again. And so this guy gets a message and <coughs> you can't send the message, right? No message to the brain, no message to the heart, right? At least it looks like it. If it's done correctly, which not quite sure how they do it correctly, but blow that toxin into the face and have that person die. Well, they're dead, right? According to at least at that time, right? When we would be checking on bodies, not really sure if somebody's dead or not. That's a nice thought. Go ahead and bury them. Well, then here comes the witch doctor. Unbury them, right? Dig them up and then frighten everyone in the town into respect. If you don't respect me, I'm going to kill you and bring you back as a zombie. <laughs> Real quick, though, just thinking about this from puffer fish, I'm sort of kind of thinking maybe this isn't a European witch idea. This one's actually from Haiti. Now, how about that flying on broomsticks idea? Now, many accused witches confessed to flying on broomsticks to attend their sabbats, and many of those even before they were tortured. Sadly enough, torture was not only allowed, it was expected. And in fact, if you were able to get a confession out of somebody without torture, that's seen as an unreliable confession. <laughs> so they were likely to be they were likely to be tortured anyway, even though they had confessed. So why would they confess to such a thing? Well, maybe they actually thought they had done it, right? It's possible that these women believed that they had truly flown up the chimney on a broomstick and indulged in sexual perversions of different kinds. So, here we have two witches. I'm missing the funny clothes, are you? <laughs> yeah, I think we might be done with the funny clothes. This picture over here is a wood cutting from the 1600s of a French witch preparing to fly. This picture over here is done by Goya, you might see the date out here, in 1799. 
and this is an older witch <coughs> teaching a novice to fly. There are broomsticks in each one of these pictures. Obviously, there's a lack of clothing. And over here, you might notice in this picture, there's a familiar in that picture. Did, did you miss it? It's down here. I'm sure you were looking at <coughs> me. Right? Yeah. Now, um, why are they naked? I thought they were supposed to be wearing black dresses and funny shoes and, and hats and all this. Well, these flying ointments, these ointments that women would use, which if you look in this picture, she's actually holding a vial. She's actually got that in her hand. She's getting ready to fly, right? They have to be absorbed into the body. And they're actually very greasy. So it's actually not easy, it's not easy to get them to absorb because they're not water soluble. You can't really just eat them. So this is most efficiently done where the skin is the thinnest and the blood vessels lie just under the surface. So it was said that they would be smeared under the arms and in other hairy places. <laughs> and you can see how horrible this would be for a community. Imagine some coven of young women um, <coughs> taking part in this type of activity. This affects the good Christian folks of the village especially in places like Germany, Switzerland, and France, where entire towns of women would be emptied from the town and burned at the stake. Okay? You can imagine just sitting around thinking about this. Young, naked women rubbing themselves with bloom hands, <laughs> greasy stock, taking part in hallucinogenic and orgasmic dreams, Okay, stop thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so these ointments included extracts from mandrake, belladonna, jimson weed, and henbane. They, and these contain a number of very similar alkaloids. Alkaloid is simply a plant substance that contains nitrogen. The two main ones that we know for sure were in these flying ointments are in two families here, hyosamine and hyosamine. Here I have atropine, maybe you know that one. Atropine <coughs> is a hyosamine, and scopolamine, which is a hyosamine. And these look familiar, right? Only difference really being, I put them face to face here, is this three-membered ring here with an oxygen for the scopolamine. Otherwise, pretty much the same. Now, I think atropine is one that most of us are fairly familiar with. It's used actually to dilate the pupil of the eye. That's where the belladonna comes in. We've heard about belladonna before. Belladonna was at, is actually an Italian word for beautiful woman. The extract was squeezed into the eyes to make them dilate. That was thought to make you more beautiful. Personally, I think that makes you look more scary, but whatever. <laughs> Especially as you're like, okay, anyway. But it's also used to treat brachycardia. Brachycardia is slowing of the heart and can, ha can slow the heart so much <coughs> that you can die. Um, large concentrations, however, can cause delirium and a death-like slumber. Atropine is considered to be a core medicine in the uh, World Health Organization's essential drug list. These are the minimum needs that a, that, uh, a country should have for the basic medical care system. What it's going to do is block the actions of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve's job is to decrease your heart rate. You don't have anything to do with it. It just happens. Like when you go to sleep, your heart rate slows. And the vagus nerve does that. Now, if your heart rate slows too much, shot of atropine, bring you back, right? I'm going to show you a quick little video about what happens when your vagus nerve 
is overactive. Slutty, though. You need to work on your presence. I didn't feel that you embraced. <laughs>
don't even think about that, right? Magic spells are a verbal formula believed to have magical force. Wow, that doesn't sound like molecules of witchcraft. I'll explain. So it turns out that a number of experts <coughs> have concluded that ergot poisoning was ultimately responsible for the accusations of witchcraft against about 250 people in Salem, Massachusetts, in this country. Oh, but back in 1692. Now, the reason why they were accused of witchcraft was because they were thought <coughs> to have cast spells on people in the community, and it was really a mass poisoning. This disease is known as ergotism, from ergot poisoning. And it's caused by alkaloids made by this guy right here, which is the ergot fungus. What's going to happen is you get a bunch of rain, all the cereal stuff, especially rye, rots, ergot uh, fungus grows, and the spores go up into the air and people breathe them in. This disease, however, was known in medieval times. This was not something that was brand new. But it was known as Holy Fire or St. Anthony's Fire. And that's because people who were suffering would have manic behavior, hallucinations, vomiting, twitching, and excruciatingly painful burning sensations, <coughs> especially as the gangrene set in. <laughs> Here we have some molecules of ergotism. These guys are looking a little bit different. Had to turn them on their heads a little bit here. I have ergotamine and ergovine. And we notice that these guys have this nice ring structure here. Okay? And then different stuff happening up here. But certainly very similar down in here. These alkaloids are vasoconstrictors. That means they decrease the size of your veins and arteries. Well, that's awesome, right? Because we can use that to stop postpartum bleeding. It can also induce placental delivery. But unfortunately, when you're breathing that in, it's also constricting the arteries that go to your extremities. Your toe dies, the tissue rots, and you get gangrene, right? Now, today, honestly, today, you can use ergotamine to treat migraine headaches. But if, you, you know, if nothing else works, they'll give it to you. But if you read the side of the bottle, it's going to say an overdose causes hallucinations and abortion. Probably don't want to take that while you're pregnant. Probably not a good thing. Ergovine, however, is illegal, not in this country, but in the UK, <coughs> the United Kingdom, because you can use it to make LSD. Okay, so we have ergovine over here on this side, LSD, right? Everything is pretty much the same, up to the nitrogen. Here for our ergovine, we actually have what's called a secondary amine here, or really actually we actually have an amide here, so a secondary amide, because we've got a hydrogen in here, we've actually got other groups attached to it. But otherwise, mm, I think we're doing pretty really good on that one. Definitely, I think the hallucinogenic part, we've explained that. Now, the witch is often the scapegoat, right? Say, oh, that old woman over there, she cast a spell on my family, and that's why my daughter is having convulsions. Burn her. She's a witch, right? But whether she be just the complete bystander, the herbalist, or the drug user, right? <coughs> that witch did not cast the ergotism spell, right? That did not happen. That was a naturally occurring item that we should know about, but they forgot, I guess. So in Salem alone, 19 were hanged and one was pressed to death with rocks. And, but you know, lucky for us, centuries of persecution, they're done. Yeah, oh, except in 2008, <laughs> in, in Orissa, India, a woman was beaten and burned to death after the
the death of a neighbor was blamed on her witchcraft. She did not say she'd been flying either. And then in this year, oh my goodness, in this year, in 2012, in Moscow, Russia, three members of the feminist punk brand, band, excuse me, Pussy Riot, were arrested and charged with displays of devilish dances. They changed that charge to hooliganism with um, uh, religious hatred because they did a dance in a church. But we all know that that was all politically uh, founded, but no. And then, oh my goodness, in this year, <laughs> eBay won't let you buy spells anymore. So eBay proclaims that it was discontinuing a small number of items within its metaphysical division, including spells, because they were concerned that such transactions result in issues that are difficult to resolve. <laughs> Luckily, there's still places you can go. witchcraft 
are considered to be of a religious grouping called Wicca. Now, um, they practice their uh, witchcraft, their religion, either within their covens or alone. A solitary practitioner is considered to be just fine. Um, their practices are, are pagan, and they do uh, include elements <coughs> of witchcraft, but by their religious books, they are bound not to harm people. So there's actually no reason to fear people who celebrate Wicca, right? Generally, we can't find their churches, not because they're hidden, but because they celebrate in the open. It's all nature religion versus God and the devil. So to say that a witch has made a pact with the devil is completely silly because they don't even believe in the devil. <coughs> so why would they make a pact with the devil, right? It's a completely pagan or Celtic type of religion. They profess to cast spells, and I bet they create some potions. Okay, we'll wonder what types, but anyway, likely create some potions with their molecules of witchcraft. This is a selected bibliography. I picked up a lot of <coughs> pictures that I didn't give a lot of credit for there. But this first one here, this is actually a book that we borrowed from um, Dr. Jones. This is Napoleon Buttons. And he gave a couple of great talks, at least one, on the um, molecules that changed history. And one of the chapters in this book is called Molecules of Witchcraft. And that's where I got the idea for this talk and much of the information that came from it. These two are uh, biochemistry <coughs> textbooks. This one is my student's favorite. <laughs> um, and this is where I got a lot of the information concerning the biochemistry of how these molecules work. I picked up a few websites along the way. And here's where I got those awesome pictures in case you wanted to spend a few more minutes with those. <laughs> let's see, uh, let's see, uh, the tetrodotoxin over here, information on eBay in case you want to know why they stopped the spell you wanted, and then down here that cool YouTube video that we saw. And thank you, I appreciate your